Um, I believe it's April 22nd, and we are in week th 13, or almost at the end of the semester, still shelter in place. And folks, this is starting a new unit. This is our medical microbiology unit, or another way of saying it is how to be a good pathogen. So there'll be two um, PowerPoints. So this first one is going to focus on, again, the main focus is, you know, if you wanted to be a pathogen, what are some of the characteristics um, that would help you um, invade another organism and cause harm, or, or it might be making toxins and causing harm. And then, folks, um, next week, week 14, we'll do the second PowerPoint, which will be on epidemiology, um, reservoirs, and transmission. And again, so appropriate now in these days of pandemic coronavirus. So these two um, PowerPoints are going to focus on bacterial pathogens. But um, I, I think in our Unit 7 viruses, we did develop um, how viruses, like the pandemic coronavirus, how it can cause harm. So this will be a little bit more looking, focusing on bacteria, but indeed some, some of the, um, some of the mechanisms by which bacteria can cause harm, for example, um, sepsis and septic shock, they're actually thinking that some of the folks that die of COVID-19, the pandemic coronavirus, it may be in some of those folks that the virus is also triggering this horrible inappropriate immune response called um, sepsis or septic shock. So we'll, we'll try to make those connections. Okay, but again, most of this is going to be focusing on bacteria. And once again, we have our lovely cat Eloise here who loves to purr and rub against the microphone. So hopefully you're not getting too much background purring going on right now. Oops, okay, and that's, that's not where I want to be. So that's at the end. So apologies, folks. I'll get back up here to the start. Okay. So again, Unit 9. Uh, medical microbiology, and this first one is on um, how to be a good uh, pathogen, virulence factors, and microbial mechanisms of pathogenicity. And if we think about it, folks, most microbes don't cause harm, right? Most microbes don't invade another organism and cause harm. Most microbes don't make toxins. So this is, it's actually being a pathogen is kind of unusual. So we want to see um, what are the characteristics of these microbial pathogens. So very importantly um, is knowing the germ theory of disease. So um, the germ theory of disease states that a microbe, a germ, can invade another organism and cause harm. And probably all of you were taught this since you were little bitty kids, you know, like washing your hands after you go to the bathroom and um, um, understanding that, for example, like if you were a little kid and you ran into... Um, a dog that might be acting crazy or probably taught, you know, get away from the dog, the dog could bite you and then um, you could develop rabies. So nowadays, from as little kids, we're taught about the germ theory of disease. But, but many, many years ago, a lot of people did not believe in it. And indeed, it was, it was a huge problem because some people, even if they believed that microbes could cause disease, a lot of people thought the microbes came from within us, that they spontaneously arose within us, kind of the spontaneous generation um, theory. And a lot of times people would think that, oh, if a person was a bad moral character or if maybe a person um, made God angry, right, that these, these pathogens would just arise inside as a form of punishment, right? So... Um, it was so important to prove that these pathogens come from outside of the person, you know, from from the, the environment and they invade the person, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to take steps to prevent transmission, right? We wouldn't be able to prevent, say, um, contamination, uh, fecal contamination of food or water, or if we didn't understand that we get rabies from the the bite, the saliva of an infected animal, we wouldn't have taken steps to develop rabies vaccine. So the two leaders in trying to prove the germ theory of disease was Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch. So Louis Pasteur was a French microbiologist, just a genius, right? He did so many things. And um, Louis Pasteur did really important work laying the foundations for the germ theory of disease. So and, and this might seem kind of funny that one way he did it was he was, um, there was actually a competition to try to save the French wine industry. 
And what was happening with the French wines, they were all becoming sour, right? And nobody wanted to drink sour wine. And so Pasteur studied um, the diseased wines, right? The soured wine and then good wine. And what he finally determined was in the diseased, the sour wines, they were contaminated with bacteria. And the bacteria were taking the sugars from the grape juice and converting them into acids. And that's, and as humans, we, we detect acid is sour, right? And in the good wines, he saw that it wasn't bacteria. It was the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae that was growing and converting the grape sugars into ethanol, alcohol, and carbon dioxide. So he came up with this brilliant idea of, he told the, the wine producers, okay, when you have your grape juice, um, first heat it to kill any of the contaminating um, pathogenic bacteria, if we consider these pathogens of wine. And then after heating it, after heating the wine, then you add your Saccharomyces. And that way, you'll know for sure that you'll have the good alcoholic fermentation going on. And you won't have any of these acid-producing fermentations. So he was the one that developed this process of um, heating um, foods or drink to kill quote-unquote disease-causing bacteria. Now that process, which we all know now as pasteurization, we use it, um, a classic example is on milk products, because we know there's a lot of pathogens that can be transferred in raw or unpasteurized milk. For example, Mycobacterium bovis, um, uh, Brucella abortus, Listeria monocytogenes, Salmonella. So, um, so Pasteur developed this to to protect the grape juice from being contaminated with bacterial wine pathogens. Right? We use pasteurization. Um, we extend it to pasteurize our food and drink, so that they so that we won't ingest um, food or drink that's contaminated with disease-causing pathogens of humans. So again, this was just such a cool experiment. So he linked the disease of the wine to the bacteria, right? So the bacteria were the pathogens. They were coming from outside the grape juice and causing disease. And he also did work with um, silkworms. So um, silkworms, obviously important for silk production, and the silkworms were getting sick. And he was able to isolate, I believe it was a bacteria that was actually um, making the silkworms um, sick and dying. So he saw, he showed that, and again, I think they were bacteria that caused the silkworm disease. So he showed that the silkworms can have pathogens too. So the other big player in, um, it was actually a competition <laughs> to prove the germ theory of disease was a Robert physician, microbiologist, Robert Koch. And, um, Koch and Pasteur were contemporaries. They lived at the same time two of the, you know, really important microbiologists of the 1800s. And my understanding is they were competitors, and I thought maybe they were friendly competitors, maybe, maybe not so friendly. So Robert Koch's lab was trying to prove the germ, the germ theory of disease, as was Louis Pasteur's lab, trying to prove the germ theory of disease, right? And again, folks, um, the germ theory is that infectious disease is caused by micromer germ, which is specific for that disease. And to prove the germ theory of disease, you had to be able to isolate the microbe of interest from a diseased human being or a diseased animal, right? Now, a huge disadvantage that uh, Pasteur's lab was working under was they were only using liquid media broths. And you might remember from lab that with a broth, um, just looking at the broth, you can't tell if it's a pure culture or a mixed culture, right? And it's absolutely essential trying to prove the germ theory of disease that you have pure cultures. So Pasteur's lab was at a disadvantage and not having um, auger to work with. It was in Robert Koch's lab, one of his colleagues, wife, had suggested that, um, that to make solid media, um, to add an extract of seaweed called auger. And auger was used by um, women to make jellies. And so um, Koch's lab was the first to introduce the use of auger in making solid media. You would just take like your broth, like a TS broth, add the auger, um, autoclave it, right? And then um, you can pour it into tubes or you can pour it into uh, petri dishes to make auger plates. And the beauty of the auger is very, very few microbes have the enzymes to digest it, right? So none of the microbes growing on the plates could hydrolyze the auger and thus turn the solid back into a, a liquid mess. 
Um, and the other really good thing is once the auger solidifies, it won't melt if you put it, say, in a 37 degrees Celsius incubator or on a hot day in Sacramento. Um, previously, they'd use the animal protein gelatin, and a lot of microbes have gelatinase, so they could digest it. And furthermore, gelatin will melt at probably in a 37 degree incubator, gelatin might even melt. So Robert Koch then was the, the winner of this competition, but again, it was really more of a partnership because Louis Pasteur's work was absolutely essential in laying the foundations for the germ theory of disease. And Koch's lab was one that actually came up with the four steps of four prerequisites, the four Koch's postulates to prove a specific microbe causes a specific infectious disease. Right, so um, it is important you guys to know what we mean by Koch's postulate. So these are the four criteria, the four steps to show a causal relationship between a causative microbe, a pathogen, and, and a disease. Or another way of saying this, you guys, Koch's postulates help you prove that microbe X causes disease X. Okay, so this, these are the four steps proving the germ theory of disease. And this is just an example here, folks. Um, and do notice in, in these four steps, four postulates, how important pure culture is. So in step one, you guys, your suspect germ, your suspect pathogen, pathogen X, has to be present in every case of the infectious disease X. So we're trying to prove that microbe X causes infectious disease X, right? So we're going to isolate it. And the second step is the suspect pathogen has to be grown in pure culture, right? So this is where our auger plates come in. And remember, using our auger plates, we get isolated colonies. Um, an isolated colony is a pure culture, right? Because we presume all the cells in an isolated colony um, are all descendants all descendants of a single cell, so they should be genetic clones. And in taking cells, like if if in this cartoon you guys, obviously these are mixed cultures, right? We have all different kinds of colonies growing. So different types of colonies means we have different kinds of microbes growing. But if we take cells from an isolated colony and transfer it to a new auger plate, okay, and here we, we have straight plates, right? then we can get a pure culture, right? So that's absolutely essential. The germ must be isolated and grown in pure culture, right? So that's what they've done here. We've got our pure culture of our suspect um, um, microbe X. And then the third step, folks, and this is the ethical um, um, kind of question mark here, because in the third step, you have to take healthy animals and inject them with your, your suspect microbe X from the pure culture, right? So you're purposely infecting animals. And then the fourth step is that those animals are supposed to get sick with the same infectious disease, disease X. And again, you have to re-isolate your microbe X, your suspect pathogen, from the diseased or dead animals, right? And again, grow it in pure culture. So again, folks, it was um, Koch's lab. They were the one that developed the use of auger as a solidifying agent, and that let them absolutely guarantee that they are working with pure cultures. And then as, as biologists um, or medical microbiologists, we always want to be able to compare. You know, we want to compare different microbes and we want to we want to be able to compare how much damage they can cause, right? And so one way to compare um, damage that different um, microbial pathogen cause is to look at what we call relative virulence. So, and here's some vocabulary, you guys. So, um, we use the term pathogen or pathogenesis or pathogenic, and that comes from the, the root pathos means suffering. So if we talk about a pathogen or something that's pathogenic, um, we're saying that this can cause suffering, right? It can cause disease. But it's not telling us how, how, how um, extreme the damage is. So we, when we want to know how much damage a pathogen causes, um, we can talk about virulence. So a low virulence pathogen would be like a cold virus, right? Can, it causes, it's a pathogen, it causes disease, but it doesn't cause much harm, right? We're not going to die from a cold, cold virus. So we'd say a cold virus has low virulence. And then in contrast, you guys, like a, uh, say a bacterium like Yersinia pestis that causes bubonic plague, you know, can can kill us, um, that would, that we would describe the Yersinia pestis as having high virulence, right? It causes a lot of damage and even kill us. So this, this is from a, a previous micro textbook we had. They've ranked some 
um, microbes from most virulent up here at the top to least virulent down below. And the, the number that um, we like to compare is called the infectious dose 50 and the lethal dose 50. And the way these would be established, you know, to be really sure, you'd probably have to do it under lab um, experimental conditions. So with some of these pathogens, especially if they're, um, if it's a pathogen that can only grow in humans, you can't ethically run that experiment, right? Like purposely infect people. But just to give you an idea, you guys, so infectious dose 50, it means the number of microbes required to infect 50% of a test population of, of organisms, okay? And then lethal dose 50, as you might guess, is the number of microbes required to kill 50% um, half a test population of organisms. So again, it's ethical issues here, right, to actually run these in the labs. But they have estimated ID50s and LD50s for um, some pathogens. So you guys, so again, if we go back here looking at the most virulent um, pathogens here, the least virulent down here, um, what would we predict? Would these highly virulent pathogens have high or low ID50s and LD50s, right? And then in contrast, you guys, these really low virulent pathogens, would you expect their ID50s and LD50s to be high or really low? So, so the, the answer, folks, is there's an inverse relationship between virulence and ID50 and LD50. And that means these really highly virulent pathogens here that could kill us, they have low ID50s um, and low LD50s. It, meaning that, you know, very few microbes can potentially kill us. And this makes sense, you guys, because if you think of the microbes as these invading armies, right, if you have highly virulent microbes, only a few of them can overwhelm our normal defenses, right, and cause serious harm. But in contrast, you guys, if you have an army, um, your army of invading microbes, and they aren't very well armed, they don't have many virulence uh, factors, which we'll be discussing. It makes sense that that it would take huge numbers of them to be to overwhelm our natural defenses and cause disease. Okay, so just remember that you guys, the infect the inverse relationship between infectious dose 50 and virulence, the inverse relationship between lethal dose 50 and virulence. The lower the ID 50, the lower LD 50, that means the microbe has higher virulence. And folks, we'll just go through these really quickly. To me, I'm always, I, I have a weird sense of humor, I guess, a, a dark sense of humor, um, because all of these really highly virulent pathogens, we have them all here in California. And in fact, this one, you guys, Francisella tularensis, it was named after Tulare County, right? So it was discovered here um, in California. This is sometimes called rabbit fever. Um, highly virulent, low ID50 and has the potential to kill. And on the next slide, folks, we have um, we have some more information on Francisella tularensis. It's a gram-negative bacteria. We have it here in California. And then we have our good old Yersinia pestis, which, which causes bubonic plague, right? And then Bordetella pertussis. This is the pathogen that causes whooping cough, pertussis. And then we come down. Now we're starting to get into our opportunistic pathogens here. Um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, this is really serious pathogen in hospitals. You really worry about your burn patients getting infected with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. You also really worry about your cystic fibrosis patients um, because Pseudomonas aeruginosa can cause really serious lung, um, lung infections in your cystic fibros fibrosis patients. Um, it's great at forming biofilms. And furthermore, it's a gram-negative bacterium. Its outer membrane um, prevents passage of many antibiotics. Um, maybe in our our Kirby Bauer antibiotic sensitivity testing, you saw how incredibly resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa was to most of our antibiotics, right? And that's protection provided by that um, outer membrane. Very few antibiotics can cross through the outer membrane porins of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And then, folks, here's um, another bacterium, which at least previously was considered an opportunistic pathogen. And this is Clostridium difficile. So we want to remember that all the clostridia can form endospores. So those endospores can remain um, infectious in the environment for years and years and years. Um, at one time, people that were at high risk for C. diff, C. diff infections of the intestine, um, it was thought a risk factor was that you'd been on lots and lots of antibiotics. And what the antibiotics do is they wipe out all the good bacteria in your intestinal tract. 
And then the Clostridium difficile endospores are totally resistant to antibiotics, right? Endospores are not harmed by antibiotics. So once you wipe out all the good bacteria in the intestinal tract and maybe take the patient off the antibiotic, the um, endospores can germinate and then they have no competition. So they just take over. They colonize the whole intestinal tract and they can trigger inflammation. They have toxins um, that will trigger formation of this pseudo, uh, a pseudomembrane in the colon. So that causes what's called a pseudomembranous colitis can cause, apparently, I've never smelled it, but your colleagues have told me it causes a very foul smelling diarrhea. And in some really horrible cases, the, the C. diff can actually perforate the intestine, and cause a hole to form in the intestinal wall. And then the, the intestinal fluids can flow into the peritoneal cavity, causing a, a peritonitis, which can rapidly kill folks. Um, the reason I said, you know, before we thought it was hospital acquired or had to have these um, risk factors of high antibiotic use. Um, in more recent years, they're seeing community acquired C. diff. And um, you might remember from our um, our Operon discussion back in microbial genetics, there's a mutant strain of C. diff that has a mutation so that it overproduces toxins. So those are hypervirulent, right? And again, spreading into the community. Down here, folks, you might remember um, that we've talked a lot about the, the fungus, the yeast candida albicans. This is definitely an opportunistic pathogen. Um, if your patient is having recurrent uh, candida infections, like of the mouth, thrush, of the um, uh, anal rectal area, um, in women, uh, often when women are put on, say, broad spectrum antibiotics for a bacterial cystitis bladder infection, then they end up with a secondary candida infection, the vaginal yeast infection. So this guy is definitely an opportunist. And then we get back down here, you guys, the lactobacilli and diphtheroids. These would be part of the um, what we would call the commensals that colonize our skin and mucous membranes. And again, they rarely, rarely, rarely um, cause disease. And certainly if they're causing a disease, either they've gotten in the wrong place in your patient, or maybe there's an under underlying issue with the immune status of your patient. Okay, so I'll keep going here. So folks, this was just a little bit of, um, on the tularemia, again, named in honor of Tulare, California. So one thing, folks, and I know this is hard to see, one thing that makes the um, tularemia caused by gram-negative bacterium really disturbing is there's so many different ways you can get infected. There's arthropod vectors here and here. There's lots of different um, animal reservoirs. Um, rabbits are one, so it's called rabbit fever. Um, it can be spread like if if um, you're say you hunt rabbits right, and you, you butcher a rabbit that's infected. You can become infected through the butchering process. There's infectious aerosols forming a pneumonic form, and this this is one of the top ten that that um, folks worry about um, being weaponized, becoming a bioweapon, right? So because it's so it has such a low ID fifty and can really knock out. Like if, if you wanted um, to wipe out an army of humans, right? This would be a good way to do it using mnemonic form. Um, you're gonna maybe not kill the the army, but you're gonna knock them out of commission for you know up to a month. So people do worry about this being developed into a um, bioweapon. So folks, with that was kind of the, the the introduction and so now what we want to do is look at some specific virulence factors and virulence factors are structures or things that microbes produce that permit them to cause disease and we can see we'll see that there's many different steps um, when a microbe first encounters us it has to go through a number of steps to make sure that it can survive colonize us and then eventually cause harm so we'll just kind of go through these steps and see how different microbes um, what virulence factors, what structures or substances they make that permit them to carry out each of these steps. So the first step, you guys, and I think you know this from our um, our virus unit, the first step is, is usually the microbe has to stick to our cells, somehow adhere, attach to our cells. And so if this is a generic invading pathogen here, we can see on the surface here are these special structures that we, we've always called adhesins, like for adhesive tape, right? And the function of the adhesins is to bind to, if this is the host cell the pathogen wants to attach to, to bind to, the adhesins are going to bind to complementary what we call host cell surface receptors. So these are molecules on the surface of the host cell. They, they have some normal function, right? 
but the pathogen has evolved ways to be able to attach to those host cell surface receptors, right? So this is the attachment, the adherence stage between the adhesins and the host cell surface receptors. And this lets us understand why, why some microbes, they can only infect a certain, say, animal. Um, once a microbe infects, it might only infect a certain tissue or organ. And one, one explanation would be that the microbe can only infect the, the host species that has these um, complementary surface receptors, and it can only infect the, the tissue or the organ that has the specific host cell surface receptors. And we do want to remember, you guys, we're always thinking about, you know, how could we prevent this? So do remember um, those neutralizing antibodies. Neutralizing meaning they're going to block attachment. If, if the host has neutralizing antibodies that can bind to the, the um, adhesins of the microbe, if we have antibodies attached, then the adhesins can't bind to the host cell surface receptor. So blocking attachment, uh, neutralizing, is a powerful way to prevent infection, right? So you block step one in the, um, the disease-causing process, and then you won't have um, damage, right? And do remember, you guys, neutralizing antibodies produced by our immune system, we can develop them through a natural infection, or we can trigger their production through vaccination. And this was just, again, folks, just another cartoon. Here's our pathogen. Here's the adhesins um, called ligands. I never use ligand. I always say adhesin. This would be the surface of the host cell, and these are the host cell surface receptors. Here's an um, a electron micrograph of E. coli in the um, bladder. So E. coli, if it wants to live in the bladder, right, it, it, it needs to attach to the um, bladder epithelial cells. Otherwise, it'll get washed away when we urinate. Here's another EM of bacteria on the skin, attaching to the skin. And with skin, it's even trickier because the top layer of our skin, that, the, that those stratified, stratified squamous keratinized epithelial cells, every day we shed the top layer of those dead keratinized cells. So that, that's part of our defenses, right? So if the bacteria are attached to that dead layer of keratinized cells, then they're just going to fall off into the environment. So that's another one of our defenses. Washing microbes out, like when we urinate, that's one way that part of our natural defenses. And um, when we, they call it exfoliation, when we lose that top layer of cells, that's another way we can get rid of um, microbes that have attached. This is another brilliant way, you guys, for microbes to... Um, attached to surfaces in our body, so biofilms, right? And you remember that in lab we gram, we gram stain our dental plaque, our dental biofilms, right? And um, a great place to find that, um, that oral biofilm, right, was at the base of our teeth, right? So we have bacteria, for example, Streptococcus mutans, they colonize our mouth. Um, they make a sticky slime layer, um, and that slime layer production increases, especially if we eat a lot of sugar, Right, so the strep mutans with their sticky slime layer, they stick to the surface of our teeth, and then they, they grow and divide, and then other microbes get embedded in that oral biofilm, right? So pretty soon we have this polymicrobial um, uh, dental biofilm. And we know those bacteria is they're carrying out fermentation, they're producing acids, and that can decalcify our teeth, leading to an increased risk for de dental caries. Dental caries, and the um, the microbes living in that dental biofilm, dental plaque, they're producing a lot of inflammatory products, like a lot of acids, and that leads to chronic inflammation of our gums, and that can lead to really serious periodontal disease, right? And we also know, folks, that microbes in, in those oral biofilms, those dental plaques, probably every time we eat, every time we brush our teeth, every time we go to the dentist to have our teeth clean, there's damage to the little capillaries in our gums, and so those bacteria can can um, can sneak into our um, our circulatory system through those little little micro traumas to our gums, and then they can be circulated throughout our body. And indeed, we've talked about you guys how um, that people that don't have good oral hygiene don't have good um, oral health. For example, maybe they don't have access to a dentist, or maybe they don't brush their teeth. Um, that that can increase the risk for cardiovascular disease. We think those bacteria can cause inflammation in the blood vessels, and that can contribute to cardiovascular disease. So those of you going into dental hygiene um, and dentistry, you're not only taking care of your patient's mouth, you're taking care of your whole patient, right? You're maybe helping to make sure they won't have a heart attack someday or a stroke. 
And then, um, folks, any any foreign any foreign um, object in our bodies is a great place for bacteria to form biofilms. So if you have an IV catheter or a urinary catheter, I think with IV catheters, in some studies they've shown Staph aureus can form a biofilm on them within like 24 hours. Um, heart valves, artificial heart valves or damaged heart valves. Artificial joints are another great place for biofilms to form. And remember folks that there's, um, if we have pathogens living in those biofilms, they're really hard to kill compared to the free-floating planktonic bacteria. And you do want to remember the reasons for that. So the bacteria in the lower layers of the biofilm are often in a stationary phase of growth, so they're naturally more resistant to antibiotics. The layers of the biofilm create a diffusion barrier against antibiotics and against antibodies. And also the layers of the biofilm make it impossible for the phagocytes to attach to the bacteria. So it provides protection against phagocytes. So they often say that pathogens living in biofilms are 100 to 1,000 times harder to kill than free-floating planktonic bacteria. And indeed, you guys, sometimes the only way you can clear up those infections is to try to remove the biofilms. So you'd have to remove the catheter. Um, it, this is why we go in to have our teeth cleaned, right? We remove the, the dental plaque, right, to get rid of them. Um, if it was an artificial joint, you'd have to go in and take out the artificial joint. And how traumatic is that for your patient? So do remember that, you guys, bacterial pathogens living in biofilms are much, much harder to kill. So we've talked about attachment, and now when the microbes first invade us, we're going to presume they're not present in high numbers, and therefore they kind of have to hide or have some way to evade or avoid our host defenses. Um, our last unit, you guys, we're going to be talking about our, our immune system, our host defenses. So um, different microbes have different strategies for avoiding or evading our immune response. So they can camouflage themselves. And by camouflage, what they can do is is um, they can they can coat themselves, cover themselves in proteins from our body, <laughs> and so it's like, oh, the immune system doesn't think this is a foreign invader, right? They just coat themselves with um, proteins that our body makes. So we can talk about um, that as a form of camouflage. We've already talked about biofilms, folks, right? The phagocytes can't can attach and um, kill the bacteria in the biofilms. Um, the biofilm causes a diffusion barrier against antibodies, immunoglobulins. Um, this is when you guys we talked about earlier. Um, some bacteria make an antiphagocytic capsule, right, so the phagocytes can't attach to them and thus um, they won't be killed by our neutrophils or our macrophages. And then some of the, um, the bacterial um, pathogens we'll talk about, you guys actually make toxins to kill those white blood cells, those leukocytes, the protective cells that arrive early on the scene and try to, to try to kill the invading pathogens. The pathogens just make toxins to kill them. And one we'll talk about you guys, and I think the next slide has it, or one of the next slides, is um, some bacteria make these toxic substances called leuco for white, white blood cell cytins. So these are things that kill. And um, we're going to see that if we have a bacterium that colonizes, say, our throat, so this is good old Streptococcus pyogenes, right, causes an inflammatory response. We have a really rapid attraction of white blood cells, and the first responders, you guys, are going to be neutrophils. So the neutrophils are racing to the site of the Streptococcus pyogenes in infection. So this white is the white blood cells, right? And this doggone little Streptococcus pyogenes, what it does is it produces this leukocytin, so as the, the white blood cells arrive, they're killed instantly. And so what we get is this little collection of dead and dying white blood cells, host cells, and pathogens. So this is pus, right? And we have a fancy word for pus-producing microbes. We call them pyogenic, right? And here, you guys, if this, this is a scientific name for Streptococcus pyogenes. There is that pyogen, pyo pyogenes means a pus producer, right? And that's what Streptococcus pyogenes is infamous for, is making pus. So the, um, just a little bit more detail, you guys, the antiphagocytic factors, um, one of them are capsules. So we want to remember that um, the, the capsules will prevent phagocytes from attaching to the bacterium, and so this is just a 
electron micro micro um, graph um, showing this capsule right on the bacterium and this is a little cartoon you guys so if this is one of our phagocytes say a neutrophil or a macrophage um, to be able to ingest the bacterium and kill it the phagocyte has to have receptors that can bind to surface molecules on the invading pathogen and for some reason um, our human phagocytic cells have never evolved receptors to bind to the capsular polysaccharides right so um, the, the the British immunologists often say it's like playing rugby with a muddy rugby ball so the encapsulated bacterium it's like having a, a coat of slippery mud on your rugby ball so if you go to grab it right it slips right out of your slips right out of your hands right and that's exactly how these encapsulated bacteria escape being phagocytized and destroyed pretty sneaky and back here you guys um, these are just showing some bacteria and the um, this is a smear and you can see that there's this halo this clear halo that hasn't been stained right that's the capsule and you can see it can be really thick gosh this is well encapsulated guys so um, what's the consequence well these are three bacteria that rely on having a capsule um, early in infection so they won't be phagocytized right and we have good old streptococcus pneumonia so remember you guys in a horizontal gene transfer we talked about transformation and the incredibly cool experiment of Frederick Griffith using his S his smooth colony type the encapsulated st uh, strain of strep pneumonia and then the R the rough colony type that lacked a capsule and remember folks it was the S the encapsulated strain that could cause um, disease but the rough strain that lacked a capsule couldn't cause disease and the reason was the rough strain that lacked a capsule the um, phagocytes could quickly bind to it and ingest it and kill it so there was no disease another one that you young folks should worry about is Neisseria meningitidis this is a cousin of Neisseria gonorrhea but this one invades usually the upper respiratory system and, and if encapsulated it can invade the bloodstream and then reach the central nervous system the meninges right causing meningitis and it's tragic you guys this can kill people so quickly within 24 to 48 hours and it seems like about every 10 years or so we'll have a little local outbreak here in Sacramento and it's heartbreaking to hear these young people teenagers or in their young 20s dying <clears throat> and then another one if you have a, a little child a baby is Haemophilus influenza again starts out as upper respiratory tract infection and then if encapsulated can spread through the blood to the central nervous system so all three of these guys Strep pneumonia, Neisseria meningitis, Haemophilus influenza usually start out as upper respiratory tract infections and then if they're encapsulated they can invade the bloodstream, avoid phagocytosis, reach the central nervous system and then cause a potentially fatal meningitis. The great thing is you guys this is so fantastic and we'll talk about this in our immunology section. We now have what are called conjugate vaccines so we actually have fa uh, vaccines that can protect us old folks from streptococcus pneumonia. We have vaccines that can protect you young folks from Neisseria meningitis. And we have um, vaccines, the Hib vaccine, Haemophilus influ influenza capsular type B, that can protect our babies from Haemophilus influenza infections. So folks, um, here's our virulence, um, continuing with virulence fa factors and just revisiting um, the substances that some bacteria can make called leukocytin. So leuco refers to white blood cells, cells of our immune system. Cytomine means this is something that's going to kill the white blood cells, right? Um, so we said that if a uh, microbe invades us and triggers inflammatory response, and that's going to attract lots and lots of white blood cells, if they make these leukocytins, as soon as the white blood cells arrive, they're going to get killed. And so we get production of pus, and here's like a little abscess. You can see that it's just broken, and here's this thick, creamy pus escaping, and it's looking white because of all the white blood cells. This is really horrible, you guys, in it. It looks like they, um, they've they opened up, and I'm so, let's see here, pus under pressure coming out in, gosh, and I'm not sure, you guys, where this is located, but just horrific pus, Ugh, all this pus draining out, right? So um, microbes that can trigger pus production, they're called pyogenic, right? And two really important pyogenic bacteria to remember for lecture exam three is Staphylococcus aureus and Streptococcus pyogenes. And folks do remember for the lab exam um, that both the members of the genus Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, they're 
they're all gram positive cocci, right? Um, if you had a pus sample and plated it onto blood auger, um, both Staph aureus and Streptococcus pyogenes are alpha hemolytic, right? Oh, no, you guys, that was so wrong. Ignore me. <laughs> Staph aureus and Streptococcus pyogenes are both beta hemolytic. They're going to cause total destruction of the red blood cells. Um, the auger will, uh, will be transparent as glass. They're beta hemolytic, right? Um, so you might say, how can we distinguish them? Well, remember, Staph aureus can grow in mannitol salt auger plates. It can ferment the mannitol, and the phenol red will turn yellow. Streptococcus pyogenes has not evolved um, to live in high salt environments. So Streptococcus pyogenes shouldn't grow on mannitol salt auger plates, right? And another way we could distinguish these two guys, if we had them in pure culture, remember Staphylococcus aureus is catalase positive. All members of the genus Staphylococcus are catalase positive. So if you mix them with 3% hydrogen peroxide, you'll see you'll see bubbles formed as the catalase breaks down the hydrogen peroxide into water and molecular oxygen. But really important, folks, remember all members of the genus Streptococcus are catalase negative. So if you make strep pyogenes with hydrogen peroxide, you wouldn't see any bubbles, right? So hopefully, if, hopefully that might help you a little bit on our lab exam too that's coming up next week. Okay. And folks, th here's another way that that some microbes can evade or avoid our immune response, and that is the ability to actually live inside of our phagocytic cells. Isn't that crazy? So you you do not have to remember the mechanisms here, you guys. I was I was going kind of just nerdy. I don't know, um, but just be aware that there are many bacteria. These are all bacteria that can survive outside phagocytes, but they've also evolved ways to live inside our phagocytes. And such pathogens or parasites, we're going to call facultative intracellular parasites or pathogens. So for lecture exam um, three, you guys, if you could remember mycobacterium, so mycobacterium tuberculosis, mycobacterium lepra, leprae are facultative intracellular parasites. And another one, you guys, I'd like you to remember would be salmonella. Salmonella are classic facultative intracellular parasites. So for for lecture exam three, you guys, if you can remember that the mycobacterium, leprae and tuberculosis, and salmonella are all facultative intracellular parasites. You don't need to memorize the mechanism, but here's just some examples. Folks. So if I just go through phagocytosis really quickly, so here's our phagocytic cell. Um, here is our invading microbe, we could say mycobacterium or salmonella, right? And so the invading microbe is enclosed in this membrane-bound structure called a phagosome, literally an eating body, right? And then once the um, microbe is in the phagosome, then these um, membrane-bound structures called lysosomes, which are full of hydrolytic enzymes, are going to fuse with the phagosome, and that creates a phagolysosome. So here's our phagolysosome, and it's in the phagolysosome that the actual killing occurs. So the lysosome dumps in these acid-activated hydrolytic enzymes like proteases, and then once the phagolysosome is formed, we're going to have um, production of those toxic reactive oxygen intermediates like superoxide, anion, and hydrogen peroxide, right? So it's kind of a one-two punch, um, the hydrolytic enzymes and then these oxygen radicals to kill the invading microbe. But, but again, you guys, the microbes have evolved sneaky ways to uh, avoid being killed by, by, the, by the, um, the phagocyte. So one way is the microbe can escape out of the, uh, the phagosome into the cytoplasm where they aren't going to be hurt. So Listeria can do that, Legionella that causes um, Legionnaires disease, Bacillus anthracis can sneak into the cytoplasm. And then some bacteria have evolved ways to prevent the lysosome fusing with the phagosome. So you're not going to get killing that way. So mycobacterium again, Legionella again, Salmonella. Isn't that sneaky? And then um, other microbes have evolved ways to actually survive within the phagolysosome. So think of mycobacterium without waxy cell wall. Just an incredible hyd hydrophobic protective barrier. And then Yersinia pestis has also evolved ways to live within that phagolysosome, maybe through production of enzymes or other chemicals that will protect it against the hydrolytic enzymes and oxygen radicals. So with virulence factors, folks, um, on Staph aureus, this is, this is a cool story, 
but um, I can tell I'm starting to get hoarse. So I think what we'll do, folks, is I'll stop this video here, and then um, and then in a little bit when my I can get my voice back in shape here, we'll finish this um, PowerPoint because we still have really cool virulence factors to talk about. Okay, folks, so we'll close this one for now.